opening song tonight is from the Black Hymnals, 22-23. They'll know we are Christians by our love, and the words are on the screen. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. They'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in the land. We will work with each other, we will work side by side, and we'll start keeping dignity and saving pride. They'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to the Father, Right with God. 
and sanctifying grace. The love that won't give up on us as we grow into Christ's image. This is the grace that is renewed each day in our lives. When we understand our inability to measure up to God's standard and our need for his grace, we can surrender our lives to his will. The work of sanctifying grace in our lives can be enhanced by methods, as John Wesley called them, or spiritual disciplines of faith. Quoting from our book of discipline, the bishop will faithfully practice, model, and lead the spiritual disciplines of our faith and call and inspire the clergy and laity, that's us, within the church to practice the Christian disciplines in their individual lives through the traditions of personal holiness. These past few weeks, we have looked at the disciplines that lead to personal holiness. We've looked at prayer and scripture med meditation. There were several suggestions to use in prayer, such as the Acts model, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication, and then a practice called the Jesus Prayer, which was new to me, in which we come into God's presence as the publican did, saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Meditation on the Word of God and believing that the Word of God is the basis of truth in our lives is another vital practice to help us grow in our faith. Henry Nouwen, a contemporary theologian, reminds us that discipleship cannot be realized without discipline. Prayer and Bible meditation are the fuel for our spiritual growth. In the third week, we looked at what the Bible says about corporate worship and small group community. We human beings were created for relationship, and it is in relationships that we are best able to grow and to share the life we have with others in our community. Small groups give us the connections and accountability that make our lives richer and more purposeful. Last week, we discussed the discipline of giving and financial generosity. God himself is our model for generosity, who gave with joyful intention despite his great sacrifice. The more we practice giving, the easier it becomes and the blessings are heaped up and overflowing. A few weeks ago, I commented in our Bible study group that no matter what they say about forming a new habit in 30 days, I find that the more helpful the habit is, the less this applies. In other words, even after 30 days, it is just as likely that I won't do something that's good for me as that I will do it. For example, I've walked in the morning with my mother-in-law for the past 33 years, and yet, if I miss a morning, it's easy to start skipping, except I know she's down there waiting for me. The same goes for regular quiet time in God's Word, intentional prayer, meeting together, and generosity. I skip once, and oh, pretty soon maybe it's been a week. I know how important these disciplines are and what a blessing I receive from them, but sometimes life gets in the way of what I want to do. Pastor Andy reminded us at that meeting where I shared that about those 30 days of a new habit, that that's why they're called disciplines rather than habits. So sometimes the effort of these disciplines seems overwhelming, along with the responsibilities of work, family, and friends. The topic tonight, spiritual gifts, actually is a place of grace and rest for me. Spiritual gifts are given to believers so that we can act as the hands and feet of God's love for everyone. The three main passages that teach about spiritual gifts begin the same way. We are one, a united body. Just listen to the first verses of each passage. Romans 12, 4 through 6. For in the same way that one body has so many different parts, 
each with different functions. We, too, the many, are different parts that form one body in the anointed one. Each one of us is joined with one another, and we become together what we could not be alone. Since our gifts vary depending on the grace poured out on each of us, it is important that we exercise the gifts we have been given. Notice that theme. One. Unity. Here it comes again. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6. Now there are many kinds of grace gifts, but they are all from the same spirit. There are many different ways to serve, but they're all directed by the same Lord. There are many amazing working gifts in the church, but it is the same God who energizes them all in all who have the gifts. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. Listen for the word one. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to pursue one hope. There is one Lord Jesus, one living faith, one ceremonial washing through baptism, and one God, the Father over all, who is above all, through all, and in all. Eight ones. We are one in Christ. And we are to focus on our unity despite our diversity. The spiritual gifts equip us to build up the body of Christ. Our faith is not only about personal renewal and regeneration. We are called to affect the world we live in. Chuck Colson, founder of Prison Fellowship, in his book, How Now Shall We Live, talks about the Great Commission given in Matthew 28, where it says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But way back in Genesis, before the fall, God gave man the order to fill and subdue the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. I make you trustees of my estate, this world. Colson said this is a cultural commission, which implies that our faith isn't a private matter, but a decision that affects the world around us. Up until this week, our disciplines have focused more on personal holiness and the church body. However, spiritual gifts help us reach outside the body of Christ to make an impact in the world around us, to change the culture of the world that we live in. There is a wide variety of gifts, yet they all work together. I grew up in the small community of Corona, just 15 miles northwest of Milbank. I learned subconsciously, both in school and in church, that if I didn't do something, it probably wouldn't get done. Well, following a year of college, I returned to this small church where, once again, if I didn't do things, they didn't get done, or so I thought. I learned to do many things in my own strength. And the joy of serving the Lord was buried under the expectations of myself and others in the church. These passages about spiritual gifts in Romans, 1 Corinthians, and Ephesians seemed like a dream world that was just beyond my reach. I had no idea what my gifts were, but I knew what others thought had to be done in order to keep the body of Christ alive and well in our community. Then one day, in my personal Bible reading, which often was neglected because there was so much to do, I came across Ephesians 2.10. For we are the product of his hand, heaven's poetry etched on lives, created in the anointed Jesus to accomplish the good works God arranged long ago. What a relief! God had already prepared the work that I was to do. I just had to walk in it. While my head and my heart quickly resonated with this truth, I still continue to learn how to rest in his work. But little by little, I began to understand that God didn't intend for me to do it all. I was part of a body of believers, and Christ was the head. I just needed to figure out what part he had designed for me, and then be faithful in that responsibility and gift. 
While some of us might be good at recognizing our own spiritual gifts, I find that most people discount their gift or gifts. Part of the, that is the reason that God often gifts us in an area that we enjoy. A few years ago, I thanked Sue Stengel for her work in coordinating the meals for Lent, since for me, that would be a huge undertaking. She brushed it off as not much effort at all. I think that one of Sue's spiritual gifts is the gift of helps, seeing a need and stepping in to meet it. And God is so wise to gift us in the areas that we enjoy. While there are several people capable in our congregation that have the skills to direct our gospel choir, there aren't too many clamoring after the job. Well, if you want to, see me afterwards. Anyway, yet many times I find that as I direct, I get that physical tingle as the choir sings the anthem and it just stirs my emotions. And I've been reaffirmed that the, by choir members that tell me that they understand the message in the songs better when I'm leading them. To me, that's an affirmation that I'm functioning in an area of my spiritual gift. That's how gracious God is in giving us spiritual gifts. As our text in Ephesians says, God prepared the works beforehand so that we could walk in them. Just as our human body is complex, so is the body of Christ. Whatever your area of interest is, God has probably given you a spiritual gift that will help you as you minister in that area. Sometimes we are functioning in the area of our spiritual gifts, but because we enjoy it and it comes easily for us, we haven't recognized it. However, I've experienced more confidence and yet more dependence on God's leading as I have identified my spiritual gift. There are several sites online that give additional information about the wide range of spiritual gifts. On your table are some handouts that give you the address for the spiritual gifts assessment on the United Methodist website, plus a couple of directions, be careful to read those, on how to navigate around the site. This is the shortest assessment tool that I've ever taken. It probably took less than 10 minutes to do, answer the questions and get the results. And I must confess, I took it twice because some of the answers, the questions, I could have answered a couple ways. But even though I answered the questions differently, my grouping of gifts was still very similar in both results. So I think it's worth your time. When we know what our spiritual gifts are, we are more likely to hear God's gentle prompting in how to use our gifts. Tonight, we all enjoyed someone's gift of serving and mercy, those who planned, prepared, and served our meal. The gift of servanthood can be used both in the church and in the community, as can most of the other gifts. There's a wide variety, but they all fit together. Next week, we will walk through the events of Holy Week, the story of God's redeeming love for us. Jesus' death and resurrection provides the possibility of redemption. He restores us to the way we originally were created. He reconciles us to be his friends once again. Because he wants us to be the channels of renewal here on this fallen earth, he has equipped us with gifts to welcome those who do not yet believe. Each of the three lists in Scripture, in Romans, 1 Corinthians, and Ephesians, are preceded by the request that unity is sought most of all. Jesus himself prayed for unity in his prayer for his followers in John 17, 20-23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Christ says that as we practice unity and use the spiritual gifts for building up the church and our community, it will make a difference. The world will notice. Chuck Colson says that Christian unity is the key to evangelism and cultural renewal. Much of the church's weakness can be traced to its inability 
or unwillingness to obey the command to strive for unity in Christ. Spiritual gifts are for each one of us and help us to see more readily the works that God has prepared beforehand for us to do, as we learn in Ephesians 2.10. By operating within our spiritual gifts and these works God has planned for us to do, we can rest in Him. His amazing grace leads us to the disciplines of personal holiness, such as prayer, Bible meditation, gathering together with other believers, and generous giving. Spiritual gifts build up the body of Christ and help us impact the culture around us. While it is helpful to identify our spiritual gifts and function within those areas, our focus is to function in unity while using our gifts. And each of these disciplines is an outflow of our surrender to the Lordship of Christ. As we sing together, All to Jesus I Surrender, I encourage you to make that song a prayer of submission to him.
May God, our Father himself, and our Master Jesus clear the road to you. And may the Master pour on the love so it fills your lives and splashes over on everyone around you, just as it does from us to you. May you be infused with strength and purity, filled with confidence in the presence of God, our Father. In Jesus' name, amen.